Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I'm personally really excited today because we have one of our thought leaders, Nonprofit Show thought leaders, Tracy Vanderneck, back on. Hey, welcome, my friend. Hello there. You know, I'm so proud of you because you are here today as an author. I know you're a thought leader and I know you're a brilliant mind, but we're here today for a book launch, aren't we? Yes, I'm very excited about that. It's it's such, you know, it's such a heavy lift. And I think that people who've written and who have done their own books just like bow down because they know how <laughs> hard it is, right? Um, yes. So we're, we're going to be talking uh, with Tracy about this really interesting concept that she's come up with that will help anyone in the nonprofit sector understand what it takes to build an infrastructure for fundraising. And this is going to be a real barn burner of a discussion um, because this is something that no matter what you do and no matter how you engage with your nonprofit, it's essential information. And so we're getting it from the guru herself, Tracy Vanderneck. Very excited to have you here. And again, we have amazing supports, our a support system of ourselves, and that includes our partners from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episodes, super fun, super cool. I hope you get to check those out. And then 180 Management Group. These are the folks that support us day in and day out. You know, we have this amazing co-host panel and I kind of witnessed to Tracy in the green room that um, I didn't schedule anyone else to be on this um, episode because I just wanted to be with her myself to really learn what she was working at and working on. And uh, so anyway, but our co-hosts are amazing. They come from all over the country, very diverse in the work that they do, the regions with, with which they work in. And um, so what an incredible group. But who's really incredible here today is Tracy Vanderneck, president of Philcom. You can find her at phil-com.com. Say that fast three times. Okay, my friend, tell us the title of your book and why you chose this. All right. It is a long title. It is uh, the 60 minute guide to uh, building the infrastructure for successful uh, nonprofit fundraising. Mm -hmm. And the 60 minute guide to part, I made sure to include on there so that people wouldn't be overwhelmed with the idea of infrastructure and infrastructure for nonprofit fundraising. So just to, to, to give them the idea that this is this is quick and we can make it as easy as possible. So when we think about your book and we think about this process, I find that generally there is an, there's a, a Grand Canyon size chasm between what people in development and professional fundraisers think and do and act and then everyone else. So we're talking like from the board to the C-suite, I mean, even internally in organizations, uh, staff members will have a sense of what fundraising is all about. And a lot of times it goes like this. Oh, those are the people that just go out to lunch, have cocktails and go to parties and try and get money. Right. And I have heard that. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is an interesting question because is this just for folks that are already in it and know how fundraising works or is this for people who don't know it, it's actually for everybody i would say okay. more so for people who either don't know or are just getting started mm -hmm. but it I, I feel like it's it's a good book for small and relatively new nonprofits that may or may not be all volunteer run or they may have just a few staff members but mm -hmm. I've had um, people that, that read it before it was uh, published who okay. said that, in fact, they feel like even some some mid-sized nonprofits who have been sort of just been fundraising on, on a wing and a prayer all this time <laughs> could benefit from actually going back and maybe adding some of the infrastructural pieces to it. Yeah. You know, it, it also seems to me, Tracy, that maybe... Um, it's, you know, Tony Bell, who I just adore. He's one of our co-hosts and he was uh, 
we, we were doing fundraisers Friday, last Friday, and he made the most interesting comment, which I'd never thought of. And he said, sometimes it's really powerful just to have your notions confirmed. Yes. Like, like, okay, we're not screw ups. We're doing this right. Or we're on the right path. So let's keep going versus this sense of, oh man, you know, I got to start from ground zero. Um, and so I'm wondering if that might be something that uh, um, kind of fits into this. I, I do think so. Uh, that happens a lot in, in coaching, fundraising coaching, is that people will tell me, okay, good. I, I, I feel like I've been validated of, about what I was doing now. But mm -hmm. what I think too is that this is a good tool for the people who do know already how to do it, as you say, the, the, the fundraising part of it. This can be used as a tool for them to help educate their board, their C-suite, the, the rest of their staff about the fact that fundraising isn't just going out to lunch or uh, trying different things to see what would happen, that there is an actual infrastructure and a strategy around how or underneath how we go about fundraising to support nonprofit missions. I love that you said that because I do think that in, in terms of sales and our sense of how we're going to navigate fundraising, um, that it is a wing and a prayer. It's like, you know, did I get lucky today versus, you know, this other piece of was I was I intelligent and strategic? Did I stick to the plan? Did I achieve the plan? You know, a, a much more, uh, dare I say, corporate approach but a business approach as opposed to just, you know, who did I dialing for dollars? Who did I get? Right. right absolutely. And, and that's just such a, a negative thought. Um, so one of the things that you advise us in your book and this, I was mentioning this again in the green room where all great conversations start and end my friends. <laughs> but I said to Tracy, I was like, you know, building a fundraising program that lasts, is really interesting, Tracy, because I feel like a lot of folks are just like, okay, well, let's try this for the next six months or, okay, this is the new deal. And they they don't embrace it or acknowledge that you can have a program that lasts. So talk to us about this. I think a lot of nonprofit organizations of all different sizes, and especially the boards that are responsible for overseeing the nonprofits. Yeah. They, they expect to um, have to plan for um, subject matter, matter experts. They know that they'll need subject matter experts to deliver on the programs. And they know that they will need to secure funds to be able to do that. But they don't necessarily <clears throat> take that same level of preparation and apply it to the professional version of fundraising um, mm -hmm. that fundraising is just as important to plan out ahead of time and to have a strategy for as is the program that you plan to deliver. Mm -hmm. So in essence, what I hear you saying is, and when I think back of a lot of board service, I feel like boards just plan for the revenue. Like, are, are we going to have the money or are we not? <laughs> right? Right. Versus and so often they don't even plan for the investment that it's going to take them to engage in fundraising or they either hire a, a nonprofit or a fundraising professional or they they think they're going to try one particular course of action. And it doesn't occur to them really that that fundraising is a long game. It could take a year from when you start a particular thing for you to really see the the benefits or the the results of that so planning not only in terms of the strategy of how you're going to fundraise but planning on being strategic and sticking with it and not giving up after two months of not seeing the results that you want to me that's what it means to build a fundraising program that's built to last not mm -hmm. one that's just going to change with every staff member or every new uh, board of directors that's something that um, has a solid infrastructure underneath it so that you can change your style maybe sometimes as you go along, but you don't have to change everything all the time. Okay. So then let me throw, get your, get your mitt up because I'm going to throw a okay. curveball to you. 
it seems to me that when you know if you if if we believe and i do believe this sadly the afp statistic that says most fundraising uh, development directors only last between 16 and 19 months yeah and so we we have this like shift we have this leadership shift all the time of professional fundraisers it seems to me like these folks that we replace and they come in they're going to want to start their own new thing they're going to want to put a stamp on it and that the board and even the C-suite is going to say, yeah, that last program didn't work. So we're going to ditch it and start off with something new. How do we temper all of these, these inputs, if you will, so that we're not just always chasing our tail? I think that, that yes, I mean, when, when a new fundraiser or development professional comes in, they're going to have a style. They're going to have a way they want to go about things. Yeah. <clears throat> but one positive selling point that your organization can have when you are hiring a new development professional is that you're already prepared for them. The, 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 the stage has been set. There is um, a, a donor management system that has been used. You're already doing all of the fundamental things uh, technically and appropriately so that the person doesn't have to come in and fix all of the ground level things. Yeah. They can just come in and get started right away on building those relationships that they are there to build and foster. Yeah. I love that. So that puts the onus back on us to really be thinking about having to your point and to your using your words, a program that lasts and really knowing what our program is. Right. Yes. Because I, I feel like that doesn't get discussed at the board level. It's it's more just like, did you make the goal or did you not? Are you a winner or a loser? I mean, it's a horrible, stressful kind of environment to be working in, right? It, it is. And a lot of times, <clears throat> just by nature of the way boards work and, <clears throat> excuse me, the way they have, we've always sort of been set up is that, um, boards don't always have the right expectations set about what fundraising entails, mm -hmm. what it um, requires, mm -hmm. what their part in it will be or should be. So, so yes, absolutely. Um, it takes one of the important things is not only having the, the right tools in place, but also educating the board um, continually on what fundraising looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you said that because, man, if we if we adopted that um, almost like as a part of a pro forma within our board meetings, it seems to mm -hmm. me like we would have a lot more success um, in terms of keeping our our teams whole and and you know, employee retention and actually also supporting our fundraisers as opposed to demonizing them when we didn't yes. get the big score. Um, which yes, it's exactly what you said earlier is that for the fundraisers, it's stressful because they feel like they're always sort of set up to fail or that no matter what they do, they're not having enough success. So if, if everything is, is really strategically planned out and all of the players, meaning, you know, the board, the executives, the, the fundraisers are all on the same page about what success in fundraising looks like for that particular organization. Mm -hmm. Then everybody can feel a whole lot more comfortable that what they're doing is, is bringing su success to the organization. Yeah. I love that, man. That that's like the, the wisdom of the day. Well, another thing you advise us of, and, and I want to move into this conversation, is beyond the ask, um, having the right tools in place. What does that look like? One of the one of the biggest things that comes to mind when we talk about having the right tools in place is a strategic plan for the organization. Mm. So often, nonprofits when they are fundraising. They're thinking about, okay, we just we need to go out and get to, to secure money to keep this program going. But in reality, supporters, uh, volunteers, uh, potential donors, 
they want to know not that you're just reactively responding to everything that's happening. They want to know that you have a plan for where the organization is going and what steps you plan to take to get there. And again, it's that knowing what success looks like um, so that you can know if what you're doing is in fact working. So when we're talking about needing, needing tools in place, I feel like the organization, whether it's a business plan, a strategic plan, future casting, whatever you decide to call it, supporters need to know that that level of projection and planning is happening so that they can feel like their investment in the organization is going to something sound. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting thing because I think that um, yesterday we had a guest on who taught me that this phrase tech debt, which I'd never heard. And the concept meaning that, you know, you, you kind of, band-aid things together and then ultimately your systems and your operations are not stable they're not sustainable and so then you kind of devolve into having a big problem you you know the debt is due and you're going to have to go back and figure out all these new systems and 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 things in place um and it was it was fascinating because i i was like looking at my own business and thinking been there, I'm there in so many ways. Yeah. And I was wondering well, and, and gosh, I mean you could you could extrapolate from that. It's not just tech debt, say that 10 times fast. <laughs> but but all of what all of what we've been talking about so far is that that infrastructure, that foundation, if all of those things haven't been happening all along, then you end up cleaning up a lot more or having a deficit where you could have been doing really well or at least been even keel if you kept up with it. So yeah, I like that that concept that, that he, he brought to you. Well, you know, I, th I think for me, is it like, everybody's like, yeah, you gotta get better at your tech. Yeah, you gotta be adopting new things. Yeah, you gotta be at the front of the line with new technology and systems. And it's like, yeah, woulda, coulda, shoulda. But then when he phrased it in terms of, you know, the financial impact and that it's a debt, that's going to cost you more. I was like all in, you know what I mean? It just absolutely it just switched my brain, I guess. And uh, maybe that's, you know, the business side of it. So I was really intrigued to talk to you about that um, again, after that episode of the nonprofit show, because having these tools are really, um, I feel like they've just exploded Tracy in the last five years. There's so many new things that are mm -hmm. available that, so that we can be better uh, in communicating and tracking with our donors, our stakeholders, and what we're just doing, right? Internally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, really amazing. Well, we want to move into this because I feel like this is the meat and potatoes of your, you know, of your whole program here. And you've really identified 10 essential building blocks that are strategies that will help you build this infrastructure. And this is, of course, comes from your book. It's available, um, you know, so that you can use that. But talk to us about how you came up with this. And do you have to start at block A and go all the way to, you know, the last one? Or how, how does this all fit together? Um, <clears throat> well, we'll start with they're not in any particular order. So okay. whatever one you can accomplish at this moment, you go and do it, you know, that way you can, you can get that endorphin rush of checking something off of, of looking at it and saying, Hey, yes, we already have that. We're already good there. Let's, okay. let's go on to this next thing. Um, and in terms of how I came up with it, this is actually this summer is the 10th anniversary of uh, my company, Philcom being in business. So Great. we are, we're celebrating that too, but the publishing of the book is, is sort of the celebration of that 10 years. And throughout that time, doing consulting, training, coaching with different nonprofits, a lot of what I do is evaluations of fundraising departments to find out how things are going through the process, what's happening, and where, where things are getting caught, where things are getting stuck and not working as well as they could or should. Mm -hmm. And throughout that direct work with nonprofits over the years, I've started to build 
this list of mm -hmm. here are the really core things that I see over and over again that either really help an organization because they exist or really hinder an organization because they don't exist. So that's where the building blocks came from. But then as I was creating them, I, I sort of, I felt like um, they don't need to be in a particular order because they're all beneficial. Now, the one I did start with is the first, I, I consider it the first block is um, having a case for support. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's honestly surprising how many well-established nonprofits that have been around for years don't mm -hmm. have an actual case for support mm -hmm. or haven't even heard of one to be familiar with what that is. Right. But to, to give the example, a case for support is basically it's a document that articulates the reason that your nonprofit exists. What is the issue, problem, or situation in the community that exists that your nonprofit is there to help either fix, assuage, or um, make better? Mm -hmm. And the process of putting together that case for support has a couple different benefits, uh, not the least of which is when your staff, your board are putting together your case for support, it's actually getting everybody in agreement and on the same page about what the most important things about your organization are. You, you, you know, when I talk to boards, I'm, I ask a couple different board members to explain their mission to me. And if I ask four different board members, I tend to get four different answers because yeah. we all tend to focus on the parts of mission that are exciting or of interest to us. Right. Um, which is fine. You know, that's, yeah. you know, talk about that, about what's of interest to you. But how do we connect? They need this, the key talking points, the umbrella. What is the main thing that we want to get across about the organization first, then go into the things that you care about. So yeah. to me, that's why it's sort of the, the, the first, the first building block is because you have to know why you exist and what you're raising money for, for the rest of it to matter. You know, I'm going to take you back, um, maybe, Tracy, I don't know, one or two years ago, and you came on the nonprofit show and you did an episode with us just about a case for support and how you create yes. it. And I remember that, um, and I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but um, you had a, like a, a worksheet kind of template thing that people could yes. contact you and um, get that, get that information, right? Um, yes, and absolutely. They can go on my website and, and get, get it, it from there. There is a, a sample outline of a case for support, or right. you can also email me and I have a, a worksheet that you can use to, right. to really start to build your own. And I'm, I'm happy to share both of those. Brilliant. Well, I love it. I mean, um, of course, we want you to buy the book, but this is this is a great thing. Um, <clears throat> well, and those tools are actually part of the book. There are several okay. places in the book that have QR codes that you can scan. One is to download a template for a fundraising development plan because development plans are, are very important to the strategy and the planning out how you're going to raise money throughout the year and how you're going to determine if what you're doing is successful. Um, but it's also something that some organizations are missing. They don't take that yeah. planning step. So that is one of the things in the book is you can um, scan a QR code to get a, um, a sample development plan template. Uh, you can scan one to get the, um, the outline for a case for support. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's even one in there for uh, getting a sample development committee job description, if I remember correctly. I love it. I, mean, I think this is amazing. Well, since we're talking about this, and, and I love that you've helped us um, navigate what we should be thinking about and how we create our own roadmaps. When we look at this, do you see that this would be something that would go into a strategic plan that, I mean, you could take these building blocks and actually, you know, layer them through a strategic plan so that you can actually monitor it and see if you're going through. And would this be something that the board would engage in and, and understand? Or do you see this more as a C-suite? kind of issue? Interesting question. Um, I Sorry, think that, you guys make me think. You make me think. <laughs> I think that 
it's something that the board should know about and should be versed on because knowing that these 10 things exist mm -hmm. um, and that they are necessary for mm -hmm. a successful fundraising department and program mm -hmm. helps the board and, and the C-suite helps them know that all of these things are ingredients in, in what makes the, uh, the development department and the fundraising plan work. Mm -hmm. um, so a number of the things, a number of the building blocks will probably be carried out by paid staff. Or if you don't yet have paid staff that are dedicated specifically to fundraising, um, then they may be, you know, the executive director may do it. And if you don't have an executive director, if you're very small or very new, then you are likely to sort of nominate a, a board member to be the one that, that spearheads Champions. these particular things. But in terms of what you asked about the strategic plan, I believe that everything that we do in the fundraising department, including mm -hmm. um, our case for support, our development plan, all of that should roll up into the organization's strategic plan. Because... Okay. If we are working to fundraise to support a mission, but mm -hmm. we're working to fundraise programs in an area that are not in line with our strategic plan, then we're really, we're diverging and we're going off in the wrong direction. Right. We may be mission creep or we may be chasing the money if we are trying to raise money just because we can, as opposed to work strategically to raise money in the areas that makes sense to go forward with the strategic plan. Right. I love that you said that. That's pretty bold because I think a lot of organizations are just like, we're a fundraising juggernaut and we're going to get out there and fundraise, but yet they don't have that sense of what are we fundraising for? Why are we doing it? Where is it going to be used? Um, yeah, I, I love that you called that out. I think that's like super powerful. Well, you are a super powerful woman. I, I think that um, it's hard to believe that our time is almost up. I really enjoyed this. I'm so damn proud of you for writing this book. I know you as a nonprofit thought leader, and I know you have all of this stuff in your head. Um, and so it's really cool that you could take a deep breath, step back, a two-year process to get this done. It's really remarkable. Building the infrastructure for successful nonprofit fundraising, 10 essential building blocks for nonprofit fundraising. It's available um, on Amazon right now. Tracy, is this in pre-sale? Uh, it went live today. So uh, we coincided the publication date to uh, to go with my my visit to see you today. So it, it's live uh, paperback and Kindle forms. Oh, I'm very honored. You know, we love anything that is, um, dare I say, late breaking news or, you know, we love to be on the, the forefront of uh, report releases, you know, white papers, certainly books. And so that I'm very honored and thank you very much for letting us debut and, and really help you launch this amazing book. Um, building the infrastructure for successful nonprofit fundraising. It's got to be on your bookshelf, my friends. Uh, this could be a really cool thing to purchase for your C-suite or for your board and to, you know, turn it in, dare I say, into a book club structure, Tracy, so that everybody could kind of be thinking. There about are it. book club questions on the web, on my website. So should you have a group of fundraisers that just really want to, you know, talk through these things, you can go to my website and get some book club questions to get you started. Love it. See, you are brilliant because I love that you thought <laughs> that. That's really super cool. I'm proud of you. Like I said, really Thank awesome. You. Uh, Tracy Vanderneck, president of phil-com. I spelled that out for those of you listening to us as opposed to viewing um, this episode of the nonprofit show. Check out Tracy's amazing website at phil-com, com, and you can learn more about Tracy's work. She has so many practical ideas and a lot of support documents that um, you can access for free. Um, and then, of course, check out her new book, debuting today on Amazon. Um, 
I know I'm going to go after the show, pop into my office and buy your book, my friend. <laughs> How about I just send you one? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm buying the book uh, because I so believe we need to be supporting authors and especially thought leaders in our sector. There's not enough of this. Um, you know, if you go on to Amazon and you look at what's available for nonprofit management, there's not a lot, surprisingly. And um, I think that this is something we must in our across our nation be spending more time and, and money on. So definitely I'm excited and I can't wait to, to, to read it and delve into it. Um, so again, Tracy Vanderneck, thank you so much. We also want to extend our thanks to our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out, and they really make a difference in our communities. Tracy, woohoo! Yay, team! Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for celebrating with me today. Okay, before I let you go, while I do my sign off, you got to hold up your book. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody, as we sign off, we like to say, stay well so you can do well and read this book. <laughs> <laughs>